welcome to Revere Asset Management's Your Money with Danny Stewart. The market will always overshoot to the downside and to the upside. And Don Vandenborn. Because it's not how much you make in the markets, it's how much of that you can keep. Hello, 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 and Happy New Year 2023 coming up in just a couple days. This is the final radio podcast of 2023, Your Money Radio, New Year's Eve edition. I want to welcome all you folks, but first I want to tell you how the Grinch stole Christmas from some Revere Asset clients right out of their stockings. Well, actually their mailbox. You see, Texas Clause, a.k.a. T.C., was working as a 1099 contract employee for Santa Claus, actually Santa Claus Delivery Services, LLC, a.k.a. SCDS for short. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and listen to our Christmas uh, Christmas, uh, show, our podcast we did two weeks ago, our last podcast. And I talk about that, how uh, Texas Claus is delivering uh, uh, gifts for Santa Claus kind of in the southwest region of the United States. Anyway... He was delivering Revere Asset clients our Christmas letter and mailer with our Pasilla Dry Rub, our signature Pasilla Dry Rub. However, TC, being a little bit lazy, subcontracted his subcontractor's job out to you-know-who, that's right, the USPS, the Postal Service. And so... So we got reports from about a dozen clients and counting, it's growing, that either their letter uh, was opened with the content, the rub removed, and then a couple days later, they get a letter from the USPS directly with a picture of our Revere letter, our envelope, saying, hey, we opened this, we confiscated it, we're testing it, or they simply just took the entire letter and a couple days later, they got a letter from the USPS saying, hey, we took this letter, uh, just wanted to let you know, and we're processing it, we're, we're confiscating it uh, for testing the package. Now, now, you know, I would have just dabbed my finger, licked my finger, stuck my finger in the package and licked it if they'd asked me. Um, I'm kind of torn if they just, but any, anywho, um, I'm not sure whether the USPS uh, uh, employees have gotten so much notoriety about my rub that they're borrowing for their own barbecue or in this political climate, especially in the Middle East with the Hamas terrorist, Homeland Security, HS, and UPS are stepping up their security protocols uh, and they're really on the lookout for salt, pepper, sugar, cumin, pasilla, chili, garlic, and uh, cumin. Now, in fairness, I guess those foodstuffs can be used, uh, you know, to to uh, uh, hide odors or drugs, bombs, contraband, that kind of stuff. So I guess they're actually um, doing stuff. But but that is uh, uh, a little bit nerve wracking. Now, now they could just get a good trained drug stiffing dog and that'd be the end of it. You wouldn't, if you had a sniffer, you wouldn't have to, you solve the problem and be a lot more efficient without all these unnecessary confiscations. But then HS would be out of jobs. They'd have to let go of a lot of people, kind of like AI. So in AI, it's the private sector, but in the government sector, it's dogs that could replace employees. But I digress. Anyway, so if you were part of the Revere family and you did not receive your Christmas letter or you received your Christmas letter without any of our rub, then uh, just uh, reach out to me. And if you were a good boy or girl, no pan, I don't know what that is, um, I will take care of you and I will have TC either deliver it personally on horseback or by stagecoach to make it right. So in summary, the government Grinch stole some Revere Asset clients' Pasilla rub and their Christmas letter. But we, the people at Revere in the private sector, are going to fix the problem with a solution. But I digress. All right. Enough said. I'm actually just curious because we sent out about 300 of those and I got 12 back. But those are people that knew and expected and a lot of new clients, they just may not even know. So if you if if you're a client, you're listening and you didn't get anything in the mail this year, uh, reach out to me because you probably should have. 
All right. Let's dive right into the markets for the last show of the year. Um, a couple of things. I got some really good articles in the show notes. Uh, one is a fiduciary BI, meaning best interest. Only the broker, well, the custodian, they don't like being called brokers anymore. It kind of reminds them of a used car salesman. Um, 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 best interest. See, Fidelity, on Fidelity's own website, because if you ask a question on Google, is Fidelity a fiduciary? And Fidelity has this really nice answer. Here's, here's a hint. No, they're not. Okay, now, this is Fidelity's own words. Fidelity advisors comply with all applicable regulations, including providing advice that is in your best interest. Best interest means conflicts of interest. It's just suitable. So if I've got a go-go tech fund and you're suitable because you have a high risk tolerance, then that tech fund is in your best interest. But I could sell you a 5% front-end loaded uh, A share uh, uh, fund, tech fund, or I could give you the institutional class that's much, much, much cheaper, but either one is in your best interest, so it's suitable. So when they talk about best interest, it's in the best interest of Fidelity or Merrill Lynch or Goldman Sachs. Okay, just remember that best interest is not in the best interest of the client, kind of like the political bills, like the Inflation Act, supposed to bring down inflation. Anyway, now, um, it's, it literally goes on, when providing advisory services, our advisors act, they're not, but they act in fiduciary capacity, meaning they act like a fiduciary, they're not actually a fiduciary. You see how what is, is? You see how those words, there's a little play on words there? They're very, and by the way, I'm not, I'm just, I'm not taking shots of fidelity. They all do it. It's all the same. Now, when assisting with your brokerage needs, our advisors provide recommendations in your best interest, meaning they're not acting as a fiduciary. But uh, if recommend, if rec but, but if, this is my comment, if you're recommending proprietary fidelity funds or funds that Fidelity gets paid more on, so there is a conflict of interest, how can they say they're acting in a fiduciary capacity? Just me. Now, um, secondly, uh, and there's a couple, of, there's another article, oh, and, and there's a couple other articles about predictions and the possibilities. Now, most analysts, most economists, now say we're, had, we're going to avoid recession completely or we're coming in for a soft landing. That's what the economists say. Most stock analysts are predicting that 2024 will be mildly up, flat, or even down. They're kind of they're lukewarmish after this big year in 2023. And, and because of fundamental valuations, the forward PE, price to earnings going forward, is 22.23. That's extremely high. That's very rich. So either earnings have to catch up or price has to come down if you're talking about a historical standard. Folks, if you come back to the historical mean PE, which I don't know what it is lately, probably 16, 15, whatever it is, you're talking about a bear market. You're talking about ugly. So a lot of people, so a lot of these analysts, they can't get out, they, they can't, they look at these fundamental valuations and it looks like it's already priced into the market. Now, Technically, though, the technicals, it's really setting up and it looks like a rip snorting rally or at least the next. I mean, things are setting up and looking really nice. And you have the presidential election year, which is cyclical and very bullish. It's a, the presidential election year is historically one of the most bullish times, especially the early part of the election year. Ted's going to talk about that. But. Before we get into the markets, I want to talk about, John, Don always teased me about my man crush, Jeff Goonlock. The only reason I like him is he's an economist that actually is right a lot more often than he's wrong. Most of these yahoos are wrong and just wrong. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly hit these bullet points. You can read the article. It's in the show notes. Money market asset trends are bullish for high quality bonds in 2024. High quality, meaning investment grade bonds, are, should be good in 2024. If you're an asset allocator longer term and doing asset allocation, uh, I, I would agree with that. Uh, Fed deficits will reach crisis levels soon. We're not there yet? Really? A recession in Q2. So he's saying in the quarter Q2, we're going to have a recession. 
He's putting his reputation on that. We'll track that. Inflation will drop further in 2024. Yeah, yeah, that's because we're going to have a recession. If you're going to have a recession, demand goes down, price pressure go comes down, it eases inflation, which is caused by printing, not by just business activity. The Fed may not wait much longer to cut rates. Basically, he's saying they're going to cut rates sooner rather than later. Even though the Fed talked about dropping rates a couple times this year, he thinks it's going to be early in the year, not later in the year. But here's the real question. Will that actually be bullish? Normally, when the Fed drops rates, it's trying to stimulate. It's boosted to the economy. But a lot of times, the first initial rate, it's like, uh-oh, what does he see? Does, what, is, what is the Fed seeing? Why are they trying to stimulate now? Is the economy getting that soft? Is it that ugly? So a lot of times, that very first initial rate, if it's not expected, if, it come, if it's expected and he's talking about it, that's one thing. But if he comes out and surprises the market, that actually may be a negative, not a positive. Lower inflation may be here for a while. It'll go recession. Home prices look likely to drop. Everybody's still very bullish on home prices. He's one that says they could get soft. Lower bond volatility is on the horizon, meaning bonds will stop, stop selling off. I agree with that one. Consumer stress should hit the broader economy. I agree with that one. Credit card debt is on the rise rapidly. And student loan delinquencies are on the rise. All right. So all of those things are likely true, but does that help you make money? So this, this, this article, stocks go higher when strategists go low. This is an article talking about how a lot of times these analysts are wrong. So it says 2024 U.S. equity strategists, while none are pro uh, projecting a big crash per se, a lot of them are, are not envisioning much upside. History suggests we should prepare for the possibility of underestimating the opportunity. God, I love that quote. Prepare for the possibility. You've got to be flexible in your mind that the market may still continue to go higher for a while. Conversely, it may have a bear market. Regardless, these guys think it's a soft landing. Okay. Now, they're saying down here the bull case could be a combination of market leaders continuing to churn higher and a combination of better than expected uh, realized earnings uh, and a long run potential benefit from AI. In other words, AI is starting to show um, efficiencies. Okay. Market laggers are starting to catch up. That's already happening, fueled by waning recession fears and recoveries in the economic cycle and further declines in bond yields. That's happening now which would continue to support further price multiples. Now, what does all that mean to Revere? Look, folks, here at Revere, we're all about the probabilities and the possibilities. So the markets technically right now are looking bullish. They're looking very good. Fundamentally, it's a pretty rich market. We need to, we need to see some economic recovery uh, if we're going to stay in these levels for a longer period for long-term gains. Short-term, the market's very bullish, all right? Now, before I go to the markets, and by the way, we do have a guest, ho a guest uh, on today, Alex Katutis. He was actually an employee for Revere for a short time period. He's actually a professional trader, trades his own account, does a lot of stocks and options. We'll touch on that just a little bit. But actually working for Revere kind of got interfered with, with his own trading, and so he, we're very good friends, very, very close still. And so he left and Don said, this guy really knows his stuff. Let's keep, and so we keep him on as an, as a, as a paid analyst. And we actually, he's on every morning call with us. The morning, we actually have four, three, four market, three minimum calls a day, but sometimes four. Um, and he's on every call, the morning call, the uh, uh, pre uh, lunch call, and then going into the close. Um, and he's going to be talking about what he's doing now. And with that, I'm going to go to the mailbag because that will set up kind of this whole discussion on the outlook for 2024, what you may need to do in the different time frames, because sometimes you may be restricted and not be able to be nimble or quick or own individual stocks. And this would be especially true with, sec self with 401ks or asset allocation strategies where you have to use ETFs or mutual funds. Okay, so this is 1221. And this is from MS. Don, good morning. Quick question. An ETF on an ETF trading strategy that I can implement for someone who works during the day and has simple 
to apply rules. I struggle with e e entries and exits. Are there video or print resources you can suggest? Thanks, MS. Hi, MS. Easiest would be to use weekly closes and allocate to SSO, QLD, and UWM based on where the indexes are against. Now, we know this person, they're a little, a, a little bit aggressive and they, they don't mind using a double leverage ETF. But anyway, indexes are against the 21 exponential moving average, the 50 day simple moving average, and the 200 day simple moving average. Something like a total allocation of 100%, meaning all in, when you're above all the uh, indices, but above the 21 exponential especially, 50% of your assets to stocks, it's allocated to stocks, are in when you're above the 50-day. So that means half would be in the money market or bonds or something else. And then only 25% in equities when you're just above the 200-day only. Okay? Obviously, this is based on your comfort level. Hope this helps, Don. Uh, Don, thanks for the reply. That was really generous of you to share. Also, you mentioned one time that you had learned from Gary Kay. That's how I took it. I've been a fan of his podcast ever since. Yeah, I first started listening to Gary Kaltbaum back in 2000. He's been, he's seen about everything. Take care. If you're underinvested, don't plunge all in all at once. Then, um, um, then I'm going to go to this next one because I don't think I, th I think they're, they're they'll be tied in together. And Don, you can use these however you want. So that was one. He was trying to figure out the best way to to uh, you know get in and use like a for, for a 401k account. All right, this one this one actually came in today. Um, um, uh, not sure if my text went through, so I'm sending you this question by email. By the way, folks, always send questions by email, not text. We don't always check our text. It's a compliance issue. It's a, if you send us a text, we'll ask you. I mean, it's one thing, hey, I'm, I'm on my way to come see you, or hey, can, you, can we have a meeting next week? That's one thing. But if you're asking strategy questions or asking about a, a portfolio review or some, something like that, then you, then you really got to uh, uh, email us that um, in any event. Hi, Don. In your nightly videos, you talked about having stops in place for everything. Do you use a particular percentage down from your buy point as a standard? What percentage do you usually use? Thanks very much for helping me be a more educated investor, HL. Hi, H. Thanks for reaching out. Stops are based on a multiple based on multiple factors, but most common are recent support levels and moving averages. The goal is to make progress and to be able to move the stops up to a break even as soon as possible. Initial stop on the first buy, because sometimes we leg in, lots of times we leg in. First buy is, is set so the downside effect on the total portfolio is only negative 0.11%. So one-tenth of a percent, or negative, call it negative 0.2, negative two-tenths of 1% max, right? On the t so the percent loss on the individual position varies on the position size. A 2% size would be a 5.5% stop. Pyramid buy stops are similar to the first buy. Take care and happy new year. Now, this is my comments going forward. I actually got a call from a client about some, some money that he's actually trying to do on his own a little bit, and he's having trouble with stops. Um, and so my comments are this. At Revere, we use alerts uh, when stocks hit certain level. We do not use hard stops because market makers know where those levels are and they take advantage of retail investors. If you are using hard stops because either you worked or whatever, then you're a retail investor with institutional investors stealing your stops. Not only that, the biggest risk is a huge gap down at the open. You could blow, you could open up way below your stops and then trigger the stop and then you get st stopped far below your stop price. It is not a continuous market from the close of the previous day to the open of the next. So if you're going to use hard stops because you can't watch the market consistently during market hours, that's another whole other can of worms problem in and of itself, 
then at least try to use only good for the day stops and cancel at the end of the day and then reapply right after the open the following day and reset accordingly. This way, you won't get a huge gap. See, if you have a big gap down, a lot of times it'll revert back up. So the, after the first two minutes of gap, you may reclaim half of that gap down, which you've already captured with your, with your stop. So that's why it's better to let it open and then set your stop. You won't get a, a gap down flush. All right. Um, but trying to actively manage while working during the day is difficult at a minimum. Some would even say foolish. But if you're going to use stops, try to set them right after the days open. Let the market settle for about a few minutes. And then also, this is counterintuitive. If you're going to use the 21 exponential EMA or the fit, whatever the level is, don't just use it right at that. Do it at maybe a half a percent below that. Or if you're using, say, the stock's at 50 and you want your stop at $48, don't do 48. Do 47.93 and use odd numbers around nickel increments because people think in, in terms of round numbers and they put most retail investors just for order and simplicity, they will put it at 48 or, or 47.95. Well, those stops, those algos will come down, hit, 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 and you may not get hit just by being a little more clever with your stops if you have to use them. At Revere, we actually have alerts set so that when it hits that level, Don gets an alert. He can quickly look at it, evaluate it, and then sell it or do whatever he needs to do. So that was a lot. That was a big mouthful. I just wanted to get that all in and set the table to the fact that right now, Fundamentally, we're very rich. Technically, the markets are acting very well. And the markets in the short term could run a lot further than you think. But the risks are elevated right now. So what do you do? With that, Don, take it away. Make me look smart. That's, that's a tough... Uh... I walked right into that one, didn't I? I just walked right into yeah. that one. As soon as it was coming out of my mouth, I said, that's softball. a mistake. <laughs> big softball. Now, everybody knows about your ultra-large brain, Dan. So uh, um, we will just talk about the markets. And what we're seeing here is a market that's been extended in the short term for uh, a little over two weeks. And when we say we're extended, what does that mean? We're talking historically how far the moving average is relative to the 50-day moving average. Anytime the S&P 100 is over 5% extended from the 50-day moving average, it's kind of a caution sign. Anytime the NASDAQ 100 is 6% above the 50-day moving average, uh, that's a caution sign. They've been above there and they're continuing uh, to stay above there for a couple of weeks. Uh, the biggest inflection point that we're referencing right now was uh, a doubt that we had last Wednesday on the 20th, and apparently it was tied to uh, some VIX rollover or some big uh, zero-dated options uh, expert. All we did in the S&P 500 was come down, test the eight-day moving average. If you watch the videos every night, you know I mentioned this level as um, a bullish plan and a bearish plan. Bullish is we bounce right there and go higher. Uh, that would be bullish. Bearish is if we continue lower and come down and test the green line here. That's the 21-day moving average. And I drew a comparison back to the top of July uh, where we stopped going up, had a three waves down, three-month correction. And really what we wanted to do is reference the low of that day in, in July. We broke it four days later, and that kicked off uh, the move down. We've held this so far, and in fact, we've made higher highs, so that um, negates that fear uh, from an immediate point. And now we've got the 21-day moving average next week. We'll come up above that level. That's uh, 46.98. That's the low of 1220, and um, that'll be a double level of support there. And the market should, if it pulls back to that level, hold. The, we've got a very steep slope coming up on the 50-day moving average and the 21. And that's great because markets in and up, when they pull back and test those up charges, tend to bounce at that level. And uh, that's what we're looking for.
for uh, when that happens. Right now, we're holding the eight day exponential moving average on the S&P 500. The Grinch, you know, he mentioned he tried to steal our uh, your uh, secret rub, the Grinch. Uh, we're in the middle of the Santa Claus rally. It's day five today. The Santa Claus rally is the seven most bullish days of the year. The Trader's Almanac founder, uh, his last name is Hirsch. He pointed this out back in the 70s. It's the last five trading days of a year and the first two trading days of the next year. We had four consecutive closes higher on the S&P, but we've taken back uh, a good bit of that today, being down a half percent. When trending higher and you have a pullback like, like this, it feels a lot worse than it actually is. Um, none of our stops intraday have been hit on, on anything, and certainly just testing the eight-day exponential moving average on an index is, is completely normal. So uh, day five of the Santa Claus rally, the Grinch sticking his hand in there a little bit, trying to take back some of the gains. Then we look to see what happens uh, the first two trading days of next year. Very often you get big um, inflection points or changes in character in the market in those first two as people that have been putting off uh, taking gains decide they want to lock them in. They don't do it at the end of the year because they don't want to pay taxes, but they'll do it when the calendar changes and you see some things being sold. Uh, conversely, we're, we're, what we're really seeing this year, end of 2023, is a nice rally. What we saw at the end of 2022 uh, was a big sell-off, particularly in the FANG-type stocks. And what happened? Everybody finished their tax selling at the end of the year last year, and we kicked off a big rally in those stocks in the beginning of 2023. We're seeing just the opposite now. Those stocks have rallied now. So the question is, will the opposite happen? And people will start taking profits on those, and we'll see a little bit of a pullback. Uh, pullbacks are, are normal. They're part of a market. The market doesn't go straight up. And the fact that we've been extended for weeks uh, will make this pullback feel a little bit more harsh than it is. And at that point, we're judging the pullback as is it something normal or is it abnormal? Are leaders really getting decimated? They've acting wet. They've acted very well. Are the indices selling off in higher volume? which uh, is indicative of distribution and the market may be taking a pause at that point. So really what we always do when the market's pulling back is wait for it to stop going down. Uh, or some, some stops will inevitably get hit on the way down, but um, when the market, when bull market pullbacks are more harsh than the, the, the moves higher are. It's the old escalator up, elevator down, and it's the complete opposite that happens in a bear market. In a bear market, normally you see trickling lower. Out of the blue, you'll get a sharp, um, short covering rally that uh, recovers three, four days of losses and uh, they, it sucks in a lot of bulls and then it just rolls over and that's one of the hallmarks of a, of a um, bear market. Um, and you really see the opposite in a strong bull market. You'll get a day or two of harsh pullback, but it's kind of recovered over the next few days uh, or weeks. And uh, as long as that continues higher, that'll keep the bull market uh, in force. Uh, that's where we've been since the beginning of November. This has really well, according to the typical William O'Neill rules, follow with the fourth day follow through day off the bottom, leading stocks acting well, continuing to make higher highs very minimal distribution during uh, the process. And, you know, we just follow our rules and have made double digit gains since uh, that occurrence happened. But uh, just like I say, it's not how much you've made in the market, it's how much of that you can keep. We have our stops in place for everything. The market will take us out of those positions. Uh, if we've got something new that we bought and we go into uh, a pullback, well, our stops will get hit on that. Uh, and we'll be out for small losses. And that gets back to the email that you mentioned, things that we buy recently. If the stop uh, takes us out, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be out with a minus 0.11% of the overall portfolio loss. That's what we do on a pilot position or our, a quarter size buy. Uh, so really it's, uh, back, last night's market was a really good indication of um, one of our rules, we've uh, and I, I quoted uh, a friend of mine who's a very good uh, trader and investor, JT at Ticker Monkey, and he really eloquently put somebody asking him the question, "What do you like next year in the market?" And uh, the answer is, "I like the market. I'll let the market tell me what to do. I'm not going to have any preconceived uh, ideas of what should happen because 
predictions are futile in the market. You go with what the market is telling you to do. And if it's a bull market, you participate in it. If it's a consolidating market, you tap the brakes a little bit. If it's a bear market, you get the heck out of the way. And that's uh, what we do at Revere. That's how we lost significantly less than the market in 2022. And then we look for the turns to uh, get back in with our short, first our short term rules. And then uh, if we get, get above the longer term, the medium term and the longer term moving averages, then we just continue to put uh, client money to work as long as the um, as long as the market keeps giving us the good signals. And that's what it's been doing for the last uh, two months. Yeah, and it's kind of a smoothing effect where, you know, like 2020 was was a, was a stock picker's market. That's my opinion. And then in 2021, it was more of a indexer's market. 2022, you really had to get out of the way if you did. And so it was a stock picker's market because stock pickers will move to cash, whereas indexers just write it down. Right. And then this yep. year, 2022 or 2023 was an indexers market versus a traders markets a little bit tougher. Now, an active management still did well, but not quite as good as the indices. 2024, I personally think you just don't know in advance. I think it's going to be more of a stock pickers market or an active management market because I think of these rich valuation. Now, again, it doesn't matter what I think we're going to measure what is happening and make adjustments accordingly. But just because the valuations are so rich, I think that it's going to put some headwinds toward the indices themselves, but there's still going to be individual stock opportunities uh, abound. So anyway, all right, with that, why don't you uh, go, uh, you want to go to the, the, the uh, Ted first, talk about the seasonality? Yeah, you touched on that in the intro. Uh, let's do that. Ted, can you... Uh... Go ahead and take it away. Yes, sir, Don. So I would first start off with, I just want to tell what Don is saying, how we do not make any predictions in the market. However, history and studying cycles and seasonality could give us a hint of the possibilities, but we, we have to remember that it does not forecast the future. We have to analyze the market in real time. And I would also argue um, that as, as a trader, a second job title is also a historian. So it is very important to study this stuff. And Don, can you pull up the other chart first? I, I wanted to talk about a precedent from the 2018 to 2020 cycle. And then I was gonna refer back to this re-election year seasonality. Sure. So starting in 2018, if you look at the left blue box, this is a weekly chart, by the way. So it's more, more a higher level perspective, but we had three waves down and this was due to the Fed hiking rates four times, and that led to a correction. And so we bottomed out in January, 2019, pretty much where the, the blue box ends. And similar to 2023, we rallied all the way through mid-year. And in this cycle, we started the correction in May and it kind of ended in June. Whereas in 2023, we started that mid-summer correction in July and then bottomed out in mid-October. And so this was then followed by a year-end rally, as you see in the green box just like now in 2023, after the October bottom, up until this point in time. And then in 2020, um, we continue rallying for a couple months and then COVID hit and that caused the market crash, which bottomed out late March. And after that bottom, we essentially just rallied into year end. And that was an election year. And so Don, if you can pull up this re-election year seasonality, although 2020 is could, was caused by COVID, this chart pretty much like was highly correlated with that year. We, in this seasonality chart, uh, the market rallies for the first two months and tops around that February area and slides downward in March. And then it bottoms late March and then just stages a rally into the election. And again, seasonality cycle work that can help us kind of know the possibilities in the back of our minds, but we just have to take it in real time. And this is just a quick short segment on what we could possibly see technically in 2024 in this re-election year for Biden. Thanks, Ted. The one thing I would like to mention on that very first chart that they had up, it the, the range it does and it kind of mutes the the effect. So on that third box that Don had up with the, the coat, that big green box on the right, that right to the right of that, that COVID correction, folks, that's a 35% correction. You lost a third of your money there. That doesn't look like that 
big of a magnitude on that chart because that chart because of the scale of that chart incorporates quite a big big range but that one big drop that's 30 percent so the little box is you know around 10 or 12 and the other one is 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 getting close to 20 so those don't look like big big moves but they actually are so i just want to clarify that Mm -hmm. yeah okay yeah, it's a logarithmic chart, so it's it's compressed yeah. as you get uh, yes, the higher. Yes, I just go, want to right? point that that was not a regular standard chart. That right, and so I wanted to point that out so that because people that aren't like a chartist will look at the the scale first thing and know what it is, but someone that doesn't. So I just want to go over that. Well, thanks, Ted. Good stuff. Yeah, let's uh, let's turn it over to Alex now. He's going to talk some options. Yeah, Alex the Greek. Doing? Good to be back on the podcast. Been a minute. Good to have you. Um, yeah. So the first stock I want to go over, if we could pull up a daily chart of AMD. And if you go to November 1st, which is like right, I think it was right the day before the follow-through day or the follow-through day, if I'm not mistaken, Don. Um, that yep, volume signature. On the, on the NASDAQ, yeah. yep. Yeah, so this is where you have to have, first you have to have your list of stocks and the homework should be done already, hopefully. Um, This was something that has a lot of volume, both on the stock itself and the options. So there's a ton of liquidity, so you don't have to worry about the bid and ask being wide and having issues getting in and out of your option. So at the time, I don't own these anymore. I had taken profits uh, weeks ago, but um, that day I bought calls um, I think I bought the hundred strike January standard calls because of the volume and the way that the stock was violently coming up, uh, past a hundred. And at, when you're in that moment, it may feel like you're late, but most of the time, and if there's an early rally or start of a new bull, whatever you want to call it, you're not going to be late on a day like that. There's 138 million, um, shares traded that day. So the volume was that's institutions. So most likely the odds are in your favor if you buy some calls. And I try to buy strikes at the money or in the money. So the Delta, if you don't know what Delta is, go Google, look up options Greeks, and it will explain to you. You can look up what a Delta is, what your theta is, what your Vega is. And it helps you measure that every dollar the stock goes up, your option will move accordingly or decay overnight. So it's a little bit complicated, but I'm going to try to make this simple. So I bought 100 strikes. Um, what I usually do is when it goes up 50 to 100%, I sell half. So that covers my principal. If it comes back down, I don't lose any money. Well, they ended up going up, I think, at 275%. And then I, I, I took my profits. I It's funny because there was another day like this. It was on the 7th of December. Um, there was a big volume day broken out of the 21 day moving average. And I didn't buy the calls that day. I completely missed it. That was another up. That's the kind of day you would want to buy calls, the, that huge volume signature with a big blue bar or a green bar, whatever your, uh, software gives you. Um, those are the kind of days you want to buy is a big, massive like, breakout on volume. Um, most recently I haven't actually, I'm, this option is still open. If you could pull up FCX. Um, I bought calls on this on the breakout on December 13th. So this was like two weeks ago and the volume was like outstanding that day. It was moving out of above major moving averages and it was very liquid. So I actually went further out. I went to January, 2025. So I bought leaps, which are long-term options. A year or more. Yeah. A year or more. Yeah. A year or more. Um, and if you look at the chart, it kind of like, okay, why did I pick that day? Well, if you go to the first, the volume wasn't like convincing enough for me to want to buy calls that day. But look at the volume difference between the first and then look at the volume on the 14th, or excuse me, the 13th. It, noticeably different volume signatures. So that to me was like, okay, that's an indication. And then luckily enough, it kept up the next day. And I think right now I'm standing at like, uh, 45% gain. I'm not selling them because they're leaps. I can withstand a little bit of a pullback like today. It's down a little bit. That's okay. A um, couple other things I look for besides volume and then the breakout on the stock because the, the stock is what matters. Like people that trade options think that I'm just looking at tables and 
looking at the Greeks. No, you got to look at the stock. The stock has to be setting up because that's what moves the option. The underlying stock is what matters. So focus on that first and then target the volume liquidity of the stock. Another tip, look at open interest. It's the amount of open contracts, whether it's people that bought to open or people that are selling, market makers are selling to open. That means there's, let's say there's 7,000 open interest. That's 7,000 contracts that haven't been closed that are open, which tells me there's plenty of volume and there's also um, enough people for the liquidity to get in and out and the, the bid and ask won't be a dollar wide on a $4 option. So that, those are a couple of little things that I look for, but mainly it's the, the pattern, the price and the stock itself. And then you pick your option. So you could buy stock, like you, I bought stock that day too. I use options that kind of like cherry on top. If it does break out, I sell into strength on the options. And then that kind of finances my stock position a little bit, but you have to be quick with options. It's not something that you do all the time. Like before this, breakout we had in the NASDAQ and the S&P, this new rally we have. Options, like I had made no money this year. I'll be honest with you, I was a little bit down actually because there was no breakouts. It's the underlying stocks weren't working. So it can get dangerous. So you have to pick the right times. It's, it's really a tricky thing and I don't recommend it for anyone that's new to the markets. Learn how to pick your stocks first. Okay, so let me let, let's go a little bit with the bigger pit. So I I love that setup. So you're saying the stock, the underlying stock, and especially the volume on that stock is critical for picking the option. And the second thing he said is, folks, if you don't know what the delta is, don't trade options. If you don't know what a delta is, if you don't know what delta means, you should not be buying options. Don't call me. Okay. <laughs> now, now, now. Um, Tell us just a little bit about how you prepare for just investing in general. Let's put options aside because you got to get the stocks first and then the options. So you are out in Arizona. The market's open at, what, 830 Central Time, I mean, uh, Eastern Time. So what are you doing? I mean, how early or 930 Eastern Time? Sorry, 830 my well, time. Well, I would <laughs> like to go work out in the morning, but it's just too early for me. I'm, I kind of like to relax, have a coffee. I usually wake up uh, five or 5.30. Mm -hmm. um, I get ready for our call, the Revere call, our morning call. Mm -hmm. I kind of look at the futures, try to make sure there's no gap downs in my name <laughs> and uh, just kind of scan. But a lot of the work I do um, preparing is actually at night. Uh, okay. I'll scan for, I would say 30 minutes to an hour a night, I'll look through the markets. My big day is either Saturday or Sunday, I'll do a couple hours of actual screening and scanning for new leaders. Uh, new high lists are great. Try to find stocks hitting new highs or try to, uh, you can pull a volume scan to see what stocks like we just talked about had their biggest volume signatures. There's actually been a couple stocks recently that have had their highest volume ever. Um, I think ESTC was one of them, that was a few weeks ago. Um, and that's one's going sideways. That's another one I have an eye on for potential. So that would be how I prepare is uh, you got to do a little bit of work. You can't. Well, yeah, and, and, that, and that was my point, folks. Here's where here I was going with this. Now, some of the people will do some investors and traders, they'll do their research in the evening for a couple hours or an hour. Some of them doing early in the market, a couple hours before. I know that the team at Revere, that those guys are up and they're because I've seen that we've got a group text with all of us, including Alex, and things are going back and forth. Ted usually starts off first, but things are going off a couple hours before the market's even open. They've already done stock screens and they've already looked at a hundred stocks or so and they've actually yeah, Ted has texted and, me at 3 30 in the morning arizona time. yeah yeah no right 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 and and, and 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 so but the point is folks if you're trying to actively manage your own investments and you're not screening and doing a stock screen every day and then culling the, the weeds and watering the flowers and, 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 and doing this and doing about two hours of research before the market opens or, or at night but, and then do a little bit of uh, less time, but sometime before the market opens, getting ready for the day and then having your rules in place 
while the market's open, I mean, that's what you're competing against. You're competing against guys that are, are collaborating together. We all share our ideas. Don gives his three favorite stocks of the day. Alex gives his. Ted gives it. And when there's overlap, that's a lot of confirmation. But we're, we're doing two hours of prep work before the market's even open. Are you? I mean, that's an honest question. You've got to be honest with yourself about what you're doing. So in any event, uh, well, listen, thanks, Alex. It's, it's, it's great to have you back on the podcast. Uh, uh, that, thanks that for was, having me. Yeah, that, that was awesome. Go ahead, Don. Alex, I got, I got a question for you. When you what, what makes you – what goes into the decision when you would decide to buy leaps as opposed to just uh, three months oh, great, out? Great, great for question. For example. You know, you, you know, that's a good question. I got to say, Mike really convinced me on FCX <laughs> – his fundamental uh, analysis on the stock and the story of what's going on with copper makes me uh, more bullish for the long-term theme. Um, so that would be a reason. Um, AMD, the reason I didn't do it is at the time when I was buying them, I wasn't too sure. And there was news coming out with the NVIDIA regulations with the government. I wasn't too sure if I wanted to go super deep and, I knew I was going to be out of it quicker. Um, unfortunately, I was wrong. I mean, I made money, but maybe I should have bought leaps on that. But usually, the leaps, Don, is the the story I I'm a little I'm more bullish on. Uh, like uh, BITO, I had bought leaps on that because I'm bullish, really long, more long term on Bitcoin actually. Um, so that would be a reason. Is, is the more of the story I'm long-term more bullish. So, so the fundamentals and the supply demand picture longer term might influence mm -hmm. you for the duration, but generally you're taking uh, uh, options out one month, two month, and three months. Two, can, 45 can you highlight, days. Yeah. Highlight because I've seen you look, I do the try. I execute a lot of these trades. So yeah. can you, can you highlight kind of how you pick 45 days versus 60 days? How do you, because most of your stuff is short term, except when you really like yeah. the fundamental story. So right now, like, let's say I've bought an option today. I would probably pick the February standards. I think it's over. I think it's like 49 days out because what happens, um, theta decay kicks in exponentially. Uh, I think after 30, when it starts really kicking at 30 days. So if your stock is not, let's say your stock traded the same price every day after that 30 day mark, your option goes down. That's called theta decay. A lot of people don't even realize that <laughs> you'll just lose premium on your options. So and it's exponential. To, it's yes, it's exponential. Yeah. It, it declines exponentially as it, it, it goes to the, right. to so the, the expiration date. To the expiration date, the riskier it gets. So I try to give myself enough time to swing that. Let's say it's a swing trade type move a couple of weeks. And then I would blow them out. Cause if it works, you'll be up. Well, I usually am up 50 to hundred percent or more. And if it doesn't work, I usually stop myself out anywhere between it's 12 to 20 ish percent. Uh, hopefully not more unless there's a gap down, but and occasionally, I, and the occasionally, size is yeah, occasionally be 30 or 40, but, but yeah, and that's, that's what people, rare, though. that's got, that's what people have to realize that do options folks. This is key because if you do this wrong, you will blow up your portfolio. When we're talking about option sizes, now we, we tease up. Well, I can't tell you what we call Alex on the call. We tease Alex because he takes big, big, big options positions and even big stock. He'll take a 15 or 20% position in one stock and he'll only have a hand, but it's his own money. He's not, he, but he's watching it like a hawk. With yeah, clients, I'm, I'm glued to my screen. Yeah, <laughs> this yeah. is my job. It's yeah, my yeah. livelihood. Yeah, yeah. So, so with, with, we've got a very few small select clients that we do this little option overlay strategy with just to that understand it. If you don't understand what Delta is, you can't even do it. Okay. Right. So, but, but the whole point is it's, it's just very, but I noticed that you do those couple different time frames, And so it's really is how much time you're trying to give that option. But normally you almost always are going to go past 30 days because you don't yeah. want the theta decay. Okay. So generally it's two months out or three months out is, is your sweet spot. Yeah. That, and okay. I, I vote. Yeah. I would say that's a sweet spot, two, three months. And, and, I would, and, 
And why is that, folks? And it's because he's screening for the stocks and he's screening all these stocks. And then all this, just like we do with protection, then all the stocks that make it on the watch list, say there's 30 stocks that make the fundamental screens, enough earnings, you know, all the other stuff. Then they go through the charts, looking at the charts. And so just because it's good enough fundamentally and it's, it qualifies, doesn't mean it's timely. Doesn't mean it's, it's staying in the sun is right now. So then they go through all those 30 stocks and maybe five or 10 of them will have a short, a chart that lends itself. It's higher probabilities of having a short term move, bullish short term move. Those are the ones you want to do the options on the ones that look like they're poised to break out in the short term. And so first you got to identify the stock. Then you got to identify yeah. the right strike and option with the most val volume. And then you take that. And if you get that pop, you take your pop. It happens quick. And if it doesn't work out, you, you, you cut your losses very quickly. So these options are like, just like using a growth stock, but it's like on steroids. So you've got to really manage them and you've got to keep it, keep it, uh, keep it very tight. Alex, and the stock selection lot. process is very similar. Sorry, one last thing. The stock <laughs> selection process is very similar to uh, like Don and the team. We all kind of have a similar eye. So we're all looking at very um, explosive growth stocks with great earnings and a good future. So it kind of lines up nicely where um, if we both see something and the team's talking about it, okay, we're all looking at it. There's liquidity there. Let me go look at the options now. That's kind of like what right. you just said. Do right. your stock right. homework first. Options come later. Right, right. So, folks, uh, anyway, that's that's something interesting uh, 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 that, that Alex does. I just wanted to kind of expose people because there's more than one way to skin a cat. It is pretty sophisticated, though, so you got to know what you're doing. And if you're – look, don't don't watch those. I remember they used to do the Wade Cook covered call strategies in the 80s or 90s. He actually got stripped uh, from ever doing uh, – giving investment advice again. They stripped his license. He, they do this covered call strategy where you screen for the highest premium calls. You buy the stock simultaneously and roll a call, and he promised you'd make 6 or 8% a month. The problem is he'd screen for stocks, the stocks with the highest call premiums. Those are the stocks that have just gone up and been on a tear be, so that the pr people ex uh, uh, extrapolate and think it's stocks just going to go on more. So that premium, the call premium is very high. So, yeah, you can get a call premium, but that stock is extended. So you get to 6% and your stock sells off 15%. Well, now you're down eight and you got to pay short the tax on the short-term gain of the call premium. So it doesn't, it, it covered calls are very difficult. It's not easy. Do not think it's, if you're going to use options, learn, learn first. All right, enough said. Don, do you want to make any last con New Year's comments about next year? What you're going to be looking for? Uh, what I said, Dan, I'm going to be looking at the market. The market All will right. tell well, me the direction yeah. of the individual leaders uh, and the trends and what sectors are leading. And one other thing with options, not you don't only have to get uh, price and direction right, you also have to get time right. Time right. Time is options. not your friend. So, time so is not your friend. It's hard enough to pick, uh, you know, to pick stocks. You better be a darn good stock picker if you're going to be uh, adding in that added layer of time uh, with the options. Yeah. And uh, happy, happy new year to everybody. All right, folks, listen, and by the way, the reason, and, and, and I'd love to have an Alex on. We may sneak him in every once in a while. He's just, uh, it's like drinking out of a fire hose. Michael Ramos was actually off on a little vacay. He's coming back from Australia down under in Friday, I think today or tomorrow. Um, he's coming back and Connor is actually flying today. He's in air. So that is why we had Alex on, but I like, I think we're going to have Alex on every once in a while, sprinkle him in. This guy. Call it in. Call me huh? in from the bullpen. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Great. <laughs> he's our he's our designated hitter. All right, folks. Listen, it's been a nice year, 2023, ushering in 2024. Please, if you if you like what you heard, tell a friend, tell a neighbor, just send them to revereasset.com. In the top right hand corner, there's a subscribe button. They can put in their email address and their name. We won't hassle them or reach out to them. It's up to them to reach out to us if they want a complimentary portfolio review, want a stock or a 
uh, strategy they want talked about on the air. You can email any of us, dan at revereasset.com, don at revereasset.com, michael ted or connor at revereasset.com. And you can always, always, always call us old school at 855 Real Wealth. Folks, we'll see you next week in 2024 on your money. It's not about how much money you've made in the markets. It's about how much of that you can keep. 